Thanks, Erin. Um, hi, everyone. I'm. Well, I thought it would be interesting to explore how we would um, visualize some simple data feeds in Drupal. And um specific focus of this is on fetching a data set from a remote website and piping it through Drupal so we can visualize and access that data and open it up to interpretation and um, understanding. So here's a bit about me first. Briefly, um, I've been working with Drupal for about five years, um, largely for non-profits um, and now some commercial work, which I do about half-time. I started working with ESIP um, about six months ago, and that's been um, great. I'm just looking to cross over more back into um, science and environmental science where I started my degree. So, so moving on. Hey, David, I don't think you're sharing your screen anymore. Okay. Let me check. Okay, it's clicked off. Sorry. Let's try again. Cool. Yep, we can see it. <clears throat> so, um, so what I wanted to do for this is I set myself the task of just using the Drupal interface, setting something up that um, quickly and easily using the tools that are available within Drupal, and we want to pull data from a remote URL, and we'd also like it to update regularly if that URL data changes. Then um, overlay a simple chart, simple but with all the functionality um, you expect to display scientific charts. So also looking for a little bit of interactivity, say hovers, and Ways to ways to explore the data, as well as good support across different devices and browsers, which is pretty important these days. So, okay. So the first step is really to look at your data sources and. Um, while Drupal makes it easy to pull in data, it does like impose certain restrictions on uh, the type of data that you can import and how that data is set up may impact you down the line. So it's good to assess the data up front to check it's got all the attributes that's, that are going to be compatible. So if um, it doesn't, then you may need to either pull it down locally and process it yourself, or maybe have some server-side programming that, that processes it um, and puts a file on the server which it can pull from. But I'm just going to take a look at uh, two different data sets. And I'm keeping this pretty simple just so I can um, outline and walk through like the steps in Drupal that we need to take to set this kind of thing up. and then. Um, Actually, at the Drupal lab, I'll aim to get into a bit more detail um, with different visualization uh, types and different formats of data. But for now, we're keeping it pretty simple. So, <clears throat> I have two data sets here. And I'll come back to this slide. But um, this first one is the classic um, CO2 curve from Mauna Loa. And this one is from Scripps. So I guess the first thing you notice here, and <clears throat> that's typical of a lot of 
it seems um, CSV data sets or text data sets that they have some documentation attached in the file, which is good, really good, but um, feeds sometimes has a hard time processing that. So ideally we're looking for um, in standard feeds, and perhaps I've jumped ahead in that feeds is a module for Drupal that pulls in data. Um, so feeds can handle um, the headers in the first row. It has a harder time stripping out all this header or footer documentation. Now there is a, a patch for feeds which I've used here. So I've, there's, this is one point where I've broken the rule and I've applied a patch to feeds to get this to work, but everything else can be done with just standard contrib and core modules. So in comparison, this um, is a Arctic Sea Ice data set from uh, NSIDC. And this does have like just a single row of headers, which is good. But on the other hand, the uh, separators between rows are not standard. They're just uh, spaces. So Feeds has a very hard time processing that. Um, if this was tab or semicolon or a comma, that would be fine. Um, but as it is, you would have to pull this down locally to process it, or um, perhaps use Python or something similar to access that uh, or pre-process that on the server. So going back to the CO2 dataset, I'm going to scroll down, and some of the other criteria we might be looking for is that um, feed identifies each row by the uh, the title and the column that it identifies as the header. So here we've got year, month, fine, uh, but we've got date and date, which can be problematic. So it would make it harder to pick out each column, um, but we're going to work around that in this case. And another thing that you're looking for is there should be at least one column or data series which has a unique um, number or identifier for each row. So feed relies on this to um, identify which uh, row should correspond to which node in the Drupal system. So when you're updating from this remote feed, then you can um, update the existing nodes rather than tell them to uh, recreate them. It's essentially a way of tying. It's really a key, so you can tie the CSV dataset into the Drupal dataset. So um, we're going to go with this CO2 dataset for now, and I'm going to work around some of the limitations with it. So skipping on. Now the first step we need to take is to set up an alternative data structure for this content or this data in, in Drupal. Now there, there is um, Drupal is undergoing a transition from everything being a node to having different entity types. So in Drupal 7, um, users and taxonomy terms and other types of data became their own entities. Um, <coughs> this process has started for to create the idea of a data entity, but that process isn't very far along. In practice, it's very hard to use and very buggy. So what there is a module called the data module, which allows you to data tables more directly. Um, but as I said, there's a lot of blockages along that road. So uh, you could do it to play around, but I 
going to get you very far very quickly. So we fall back to the idea of um, a data point being a node in Drupal. So each type of data you might support would be its own content type. And a content type would have certain fields which correspond to each row of the CSV. That is, they'd be their own series. So if, in terms of the chart side, um, the year and month might be the x-axis time series, and then you've got this list of additional series as, uh, as each column. And each column here would then be a field in Drupal. And Drupal Core provides the basic field types that we need, either an integer, float, a decimal, or a date field are the most common ones. And those correspond to the data types in MySQL they use in the, in the column schemas. So I'm going to start off um, by uh, setting up a content type. And I'm going to walk through how we'd uh, do this in Drupal. So the first step is to set up a content type. Um, so just bear with me. Um, I have this kind of vanilla Drupal 7 build. And all I've done is really uh, installed the key modules. And I've actually added the fields already just to speed up the process. But um, go to content types, add a new content type. I already have some um, set up in the system, so I'm going to call everything uh, demo here. By the way, feel free to um, interrupt with quick questions if anything I've forgotten too fast or um, something's not clear. So. So, okay, we're going to just do some basic configuration of this content type. Save and add new fields. Um, we'll remove the body field. So whilst um, this isn't strictly so segregated from content, it also has the advantage that if you're using content types, then the support for workflows and other processes in Drupal is very strong, so you can apply those to your data, um, your data points. So I'm going to add a few fields here. I'll bring up the data set here just to show the mapping. Um, the first one will be a year, which uh, I have an inter integer field here, because we're just keeping it simple. So we'll add that. Um, next one is the month. That's added. And then I'll add a field for the just one of these uh, CO2 series, which will be this float field. So floats are just, um, in MySQL, numbers with decimal points as opposed to integers. So that forms our data structure in Drupal, which is ready to receive this data from this um, URL CSV. And so now we need to set up the intermediate step of pulling this into Drupal, into this data structure that's waiting for it. And the way that we do that is using the feeds module. So now I'll go ahead and let me just bring up the slides again. Uh, 
and move on. And we can refer to this as I'm setting it up. But um, let's go to structure, feeds importers, add an importer. So I'm going to um, call this uh, demo uh, import CO2. Create that. So Feeds has pretty good documentation here, but um, you only need to really use some of these settings. The it's essentially comprised of um, three sections. One describes where the data should be fetched from. So you select a fetcher. And all of these are kind of modular, so you can add in new contra modules that might provide different sources. Um, so then you've got so you've got the fetcher, you've got the the parser module that you're using. So what format is the data in? How are we going to parse it? And then the processor, which is how should we process this data and where should we inject it into Drupal and how. And that describes the kind of the content type we're injecting the data into and the mapping between the fields on the CSV or the columns on the CSV and the fields in the Drupal content type. So before we launch into that, there's a couple of basic settings. Um, these can be left, but um, you can either just use a single form to say this will probably be clearer later on, but um, feeds essentially provides a form where we say, okay, pull from this URL. So maybe instead of just using a form, we could use another content type to say, okay, here are 10 URLs. So pull from all these 10 URLs and do that every so often. Um, here you can set how regularly feeds will check uh, that remote data source for updates. But I'm going to leave this in a standard uh, form for now. So on the fetcher, um, the standard one is either from a uh, web URL or from a file. Now the file could be something you upload from your local system or it could be a file on the server which could be useful in case you have some other script that's maybe processing that data before you're putting it into Drupal. So the um, FTP is a contrib module which actually works pretty well. Uh, I tried this out in response to the fact that this um, NSIDC data set is actually uh, provided by the FTP protocol. So it's a little more cumbersome to set up, but that can be done. So there's not really, so we're selecting HTTP for web URL here, and there's not too many settings. Um, we can skip past that. Next, we're setting, uh, we need to select a CSV parser. And again, um, if you just Google for Drupal feeds parsers, then there's a quite a large array of uh, different data formats that could be supported here. But here we'll select CSV. And in the settings, um, we can select different delimiters uh, have semicolon, comma, or tab, um, but not space, unfortunately. And this, these fields for header size and active header, these are actually not standard feeds. Um, the standard feeds module right now will only support your header row, either or either no header row at all, or um, a header row in the first row. But 
with this patch, which I hope will make it into the module soon, we can say, okay, in this case, the first 58 rows of this CSV are uh, just documentation. So we're just going to ignore that. And the header row that we want to use to um, identify the, the CSV columns in the fields is uh, number 55. So that can help to pick header row with unique um, labels, which feeds needs. So going back to the data set, this is saying, OK, um, strip out this um, introductory text and use this row, year, month, date, date, CO2. So I'll save that. So the processor, we can inject this into different types of entities. And um, there's another piece of work in progress for feeds where you can um, inject your data into any entity that exists in the system. But that's very much still in progress right now. Uh, so here we're using the node processor that maps to the content type that we created. So on the settings, I'll move my slide on. So we can say, OK, if the data, the remote data, data um, is updated, then when feeds checks it, then don't just create new data points. Instead, identify um, which data in the remote URL maps to which nodes in the Drupal system and just update them. Don't um, We don't want to create a whole mass of data and then have to sort it out later, so that, that keeps things tidy. And then um, here we select the case of which content type do we want to inject this data into. And here it's uh, demo data CO2 that we just created. And the other settings we can skip over for now. I'll save that. So next we're moving on to the mapping. Uh, this is probably the most bulky piece of configuration in the feeds importer. It's essentially just saying map these CSV columns to these fields in this content type that we have um, decided we want to inject our data into. So in the source uh, column here, that, um, that equates to the uh, column label that we've selected to be our header. Yeah, so this would be year. And that's actually not case sensitive, so don't need to worry too much about that. But then we'd select, so in the target, these are a list of uh, a mix of node attributes and fields that are on that content type. So we select year here and add. And then we go through and complete the mapping. So we've got month going over to the month field. It's often easy to just click save here, but actually that won't add the field. You have to click this add button on the right. So I'm going to map the date field. Now, because these headers are non-unique, then um, this is an ideal situation. Um, and that really needs to be fixed in feeds, I think. But for now, it's picking out this column. And I'm going to map that to the title of the node so we can identify which data point is which. Um, and then I'm going to map the CO2 column to the CO2 field that created.
So now we've got all the fields that we need, um, but there's one aspect to this which is probably not so clear. Um, we need to take the column that has a unique key for each data point, um, as I talked about earlier, and we need to tell feeds that that's um, a unique identifier within Drupal for this for each data point. Um, so the way we do that is here I'm going to use the date field because well even though these aren't distinguished each either one is um, unique for each data point and that's the important aspect. It doesn't really matter but so long as you know that that is unique and it won't be repeated. Then so we select date date column and here we set this to uh, GUID. And we say, we click the settings and we say, oh yeah, use this as the unique field. So this is almost like, um, it really maps to a kind of primary key in MySQL, where it's saying, um, this is an identifier for this row. We can reorder these, um, mainly to tidy things up. But and we'll save that. Okay, so that uh, finishes the setup of the feeds importer. So now we need to go ahead and actually import the data itself. So, at the beginning I mentioned that we're setting this to use a standalone form. To So the one thing that we haven't told feeds is, okay, so what's the URL that we want to get this from? So you can use this importer for any um, URL that matches this um, data type, or remote data type. And those exist on the import path. Now, it's kind of hard to find that in the menu system, so I'm just going to type it in. And this lists all the importers, some of which I've already set up, but this is the one we just set up. go to this importer then it lists um, okay so we can override some of the settings that we set up in the importer some of them are um, just defaults that you can override as you go but we'll leave these and this is the URL of the, the data source so we're gonna click import and hope for the best Okay, so that's now coming in. So great, it's created um, 671 nodes, or where each node is a data point. So you can do a quick check and check that that maps to what you expected from your uh, CSV. Well, it's difficult to tell, but that looks reasonable. Um, so we can go to the content. Let's go to the content dashboard to see if it's come in. This is actually a different content type, but I'll, I'll reset. And select the demo data CO2. So yeah, we've got we've got our we've got our data into our uh, content type as as nodes, and we'll just check to see if the data's coming okay. And for this one, it has actually the the minus 99.9 9 um, values are actually in the data set. And I'll just go on to what I mean. You could filter those, try and filter those before it comes into Drupal, but um, 
in this case, you can actually also apply the workflow systems in Drupal to manage each data point, which is actually really useful. So to do that, I set up a um, a view, quite a simple view, which is on admin CO2. This is just showing our data points and allowing us to um, moderate them. So uh, okay, well, I'll select a data type here, a content type as it were. So we'll filter by the demo data CO2 content type. Now I'm going to sort this um, by this new CO2 column or the CO2 field. I don't know. So we've got a few um, outlier data, so we'll just unpublish those by selecting. And this is set up with um, a module called operations in Drupal, which means you can apply an operation, apply it to a series of nodes um, in any view. So I can select unpublish here. So the data is um, still there, but we've just unpublished it, and we'll filter up when we set up our view to do the visualization. Okay, so that's good. So we've completed the step of pulling our data into Drupal. Now it's time to actually put a front end on that and present it in a, in a better way. So there's a pretty wide range of um, different visualization uh, frameworks, both in JavaScript, uh, Bash. Um, the most modern ones use HTML5 and either um, the Canvas tag or SVG. And the best will uh, fall back to different technologies as they encounter browsers um, that will or won't support them. So, one of the front runners is the Google Visualization API. That's in L5 and SVG, which is a vector drawn format for the web. Now, in IE, it falls back to which is slower, but the end result is this, these can work well across the verse. So in Drupal, um, there's a module called GVS, which you apply as a views display plugin, and that taps into the visualization API and allows expose a lot of the configuration options. So we don't need to dive in and progress program this ourselves. So. In trying out a range of different modules and frameworks for Drupal, I found this the quickest and easiest to get set up. There are quite a number of really strong uh, charting frame, uh, frameworks in JavaScript, but the, uh, the points that I'm putting across here mainly relate to how well those are implemented in Drupal. So on the Google side, um, I find it very easy to get fast results. There's a lot of the settings are exposed through the configuration interface. So you can um, set all those important aspects of charts that you need for science. Um, you know, you can have proper axis labels and um, set the axis maximum and minimum, which a lot of um, Drupal modules won't let you do or they're not far enough along to let you do that. And 
that's I mean that's basic, but it's important too. I mean we need we need to have a decent presentation. So the Google API also has a large number of types, which I hope to delve further into in the Drupal lab, the ETIP meeting and so on and so on. That's good um, cross device support. There's one drawback, which is uh, it seems like because of the large number of configuration options, although they they're not hard to understand, but it seems to overload view somewhat. So we'll see that the settings dialog in views takes quite a long time to load. So I will just um, go ahead and create a view for the utilizing this GVS module. Okay, um, so let's go create a view. CO2. Now, so we want to show content of type. Um, this is the content type that we've used to contain our data. Um, so we're creating a page, right? And the page title is fine, path is fine. Um, so in the display format for GVS, uh, if we just select GVS here, and we're using fields. So in views, each field is corresponds to a data series. Um, so in the chart, then one data series might be the x-axis values. The next may be um, a series of series that are displayed on the chart in a uh, timeline, or along the timeline in this case. So we're going to say zero items, which in views is shorthand for show everything. We'll uh, turn off the pager and go on and edit that. So that... Um, that first screen I just stepped through is new in Drupal 7, and that is just a shortcut way to set up a view initially. This screen is the main configuration interface. So now, the first thing we need to do is set up our fields. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the title. And we'll add. Um, the year, first of all. And then the CO2 series. Now we go ahead and configure the chart itself, and that's in the um, EBS format settings. But this is where I was saying this module is a little. Um, this uh, screen comes up quickly, but when you first of all you'd set the title. So we say atmospheric. options. So we need to give it um, a minute or 
to to actually load up. The only drawback I found with this. So, I guess now would be a good time for any questions. If um, anything's been unclear so far, or uh, anything, any other comments? I think there's one quick comment to mute your line if you're not talking. through like some of the other libraries since we're pretty short on time. Um, so Flot is another one that's uh, it's actually a graphing library for jQuery. And it has um, a pretty good integration, although quite a lot is broken. And I can I can show you the results with that. Um, I think the module definitely needs some work, but the library itself is very strong, so it'd be good to see it brought forward in Drupal. But okay, so now the configuration is finally loaded. We selected a line chart. So these series of drop downs are the x axis and, and y axis uh, series. So we can have um, the line chart is pretty much just a series of labels on the x axis and uh, just uh, num uh, up to 20 series on the y-axis. So we'll just select those two. Now there's a lot of uh, configurability here, but I'm just going to just set the axis titles and just tweak some of the configuration. So these labels along the horizontal axis should be outside the axes. Um, set a horizontal axis title of year. We can set a um, let's push these y-axis labels outside and set a title. Okay, so that's all we're going to use right now. But you can change a lot of the appearance settings. You can also um, use a log or linear axis uh, or um, scale on the axes, which could be pretty useful for science applications. Um, yeah, and you can also set different color schemes, which can be nice. There's a range there. So, uh, is, is it possible, David? Is it possible to uh, uh, expose any of these switches to the, you know, the, the end user on the site to change things around, or are these all preset? Um, these chart settings are within the view, but um, I know the uh, these is part of a suite of modules created by uh, the Jefferson Institute. And I know they have a um, site which allows you to do visualizations yourself. So um, it's possible in that suite, then uh, there could be some module that exposes these, because that's what they do in their own site. So um, yeah, definitely something worth checking out. But um, yeah, you can expose filters and as you do normally in views. So say you wanted to filter it down to show only between such and such a year and such and such a year, and you could do that. Um, but I'll just okay, so we've got a filter for our content type here, and we're saying only show those published notes, so we can um, pick out the outliers or the um, or the bad data. And then 
I'm going to remove this sort criteria here. So we should be able to save that and get a, a chart. And I'm going to go to this path, which is demo visualize CO2. Okay, so it's worked. Great. Um, I guess what's good about this is this module isn't just isn't too fussy about what you give it. A lot of the other modules um, that I've worked with are very fussy about data types, and in this case, we haven't actually been, we haven't actually gone to the length of giving it the year and the month, but still plotted out this time series correctly. Um, and yeah, the, there's a bit of separation on the years, but we can live with that for now. And it has some pretty nice uh, aspects. So <clears throat> when you hover over this legend, it will highlight the series you're looking at, which could be useful if you've got a lot of different um, series displayed on this chart. And you can hover over for data points. And uh, this is actually pretty robust for a simple chart. You can set the axis maximum minimum. You can do all you need to do for a, um, a decent chart, which is actually pretty hard with some of the other modules that I tried. So I um, I've set up some other charts to just look at um, one of the other visualization types provided by GVS and to show you what I got out with FLOT as well. Um, and I'll just skip over to those. So this setup was the previous one I'd done for the same CO2 data set, and this is the same line chart, but if we use um, a scatter chart, we can not just use labels on the x-axis, but actual numeric data, and you'll see in this case, because it's not a series, and we've only given it uh, the year to plot, then it's aggregated those data points on, or position the data points on the year, which could be useful in some cases. Um, <clears throat> in others, we might want to do something to merge those year and month fields into a proper date field and plot that instead. Or fix that um, part of feeds which doesn't allow us to pick out the, the float, float date column in the CSV. So if I skip back to this um, CSV, then we need to say, okay, we need to pick out this this column here. And just say this is column zero, one, two, three. Um, we're gonna just plot this float value as the date, and that will give us a better graph. Now that should be possible, but I think there's a bug with the the header patch that I'm using. So hopefully we can get that fixed soon. I also did that with a C, that the initial CIS data set that uh, I mentioned. But because it doesn't have a consistent separator, I had to pull that down locally and uh, separate that out uh, kind of manually using a spreadsheet. But um, just this is how that turned out. First of all, this is the um, the line chart in a different color scheme. And Again, you can hover over. So there are two. I use two series here on the y-axis. Um, one includes a central area, or includes an assumption about the central area of the Arctic ice cap. Uh, the other excludes it. So that's kind of a 
a methodology or data gathering difference there. But um, when you hover over the series, it will highlight it. You can pick out data points. Um, this is um, the views filters that I mentioned before. So <clears throat> we could select, say, we just want to see after um, 1990 and before year 2000. That should filter down the data set to those years. And right now, that doesn't seem to work without, um, it requires a page reload, but views is essentially filtering down that data before it reaches the chart application. There's also a lot you can do with the the front end in the in JavaScript because every one of these actions is exposed to the DOM and um, to JavaScript events. So you could also write quite a lot on this to hook into different um, actions on the, the user side. So I also did a scatter here, which looks quite nice. And going back to Flot, um, yeah, Flot was pretty easy to set up, but it had some pretty basic breakages with just identifying um, series, and for some, and you couldn't set the axis labels. Now that might be part of an upgrade getting this module onto 7, Drupal 7, but um, there's definitely some work to be done there. Uh, it does have quite a nice interactive kind of explorer, which I'll show you. Uh, this is this is the result for the CO2 data set. Now, it actually looks pretty nice, but um, you soon see that the x-axis series hasn't been mapped out properly. It's just showing the number of the data point. And uh, it's actually, this should actually be a line chart, but it's not showing it. And I think the reason why it's not identifying, it's identifying each point as a series. So this legend is, is huge. But um, the open source world, I guess, is messy sometimes and it will be good to get some of this fixed because Flot is a really good library. But um, So yeah, with the Explorer here you can actually just drag and select a portion of the data set. It will zoom in on that and show where you are in context in this bottom um, chart. Then you could go back by selecting this bottom one, etc. That's quite a nice way to um, explore what's going on on, on scale and in detail within these data sets. Say, for example, to explore the seasonal cycles. So visually, it comes out pretty well, but um, be nice to see some of those those bugs fixed. So. Another one I tried was um, High Charts, which um, is actually another strong library, but the Drupal implementation of it is is not too far along. I I did get a chart out, but it was very picky about the types of fields um, in the content type that I was using, whether it was a integer or a date field or a string on the x-axis series, and um, the configuration wasn't as uh, fully featured as uh, the Google, uh, the GVS module. Also, a lot of these don't seem to have scatter chart support, and um, that's pretty essential for science. So, yeah, just to mention, there's an, a second branch to that, which is probably even worse off than the first one, but. I think they're trying to express more high options to, to users and views. And I'm hoping that will 
bring along the high charts implementation as well. So that's it. Um, just if you have any questions, just um, shout out, and I'm at these places. If you want to get in touch afterwards, um, I set up a repository for the modules and configuration for this demo. Um, should be in features, so you should be able to download that. Um, I'll push it up after the the webinar finishes, and uh, I'm hoping to go into more detail or more um, look at more different data types, pulling from different services. Um, different types of visualizations at the Drupal lab. Um, this is more focused on a walkthrough of how will we get this set up. So, yeah, um, anyone got anything to say? Any experiences with charting libraries in Drupal also? Thanks, David. This has been uh, uh, really, really uh, useful, I think, to a lot of people. And uh, uh, we will also get this up on uh, on YouTube uh, in the next week or so, uh, so people who aren't here can see it. Cool. Yeah. Um, I guess it can be messy, so it's good to know um, how to navigate through the potholes and roadblocks out there in the open source world. But I think. Yeah, using this uh, recipe, you can really uh, pull something together pretty quickly. Um, okay. yeah. Cool. While people are still here, let me just announce a couple things. Um, next month, we will not have a call because of DrupalCon. Um, and then uh, in June, we will have a call, and we're going to be going uh, diving deep into some semantic web uh, uh, issues um, with uh, Drupal 7. And looking ahead to Drupal 8, um, and uh, um, and then uh, uh, July, of course, um, is the Drupal Lab on July 9th. We already have a good lineup of uh, of presenters. We I think we have one one more spot if you have uh, something you'd like to present. Um, and uh, I just got an email from WebChick. Um, she uh, she can't make uh, the July uh, meeting because she and her partner are adopting a, a baby at this point. Um, and uh, but she's going to uh, be looking for someone uh, who can uh, give us a real great introduction to what's going on with uh, Drupal 8 at Drupal App, and we'll get that name as soon as I as soon as I get it. Um, so there's going to be some. Uh, um, I'm in. Uh, Research Triangle Drupal Working Group, and we uh, we're hoping to get some locals into the uh, into the mix as well. Um, okay. Um, anybody have questions for for David on uh, on data access? Yeah, if you do, it would be good to um, meet up at the Drupal Lab, too. It would be a good place to share experiences, I think. There may well be other um, visualization modules out there and uh, other libraries it would be good to work on support for. If you have any suggestions, that would be great. So, thanks. All right. Uh, Thank you, David. Uh, any any comments uh, or issues from uh, people on the call? Thank you. No, thank, thank you very much for doing this. Very helpful. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. I'm glad. Glad it's of help. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Yeah.